Hi, I'm Jacob Haldren, the editor of The National Interest, and it is a pleasure for me to welcome two of my colleagues and friends, Melinda Herring and William Ruger, both of whom are card-carrying Republicans, proud Republicans indeed. However, a fundamental gulf exists between our two panelists over how to approach Ukraine. And this gulf mirrors the one, both taking place in the Republican Party, in debates more broadly in the United States and in Europe as well. As usual, Henry Kissinger inflamed the debate at Davos by putting his finger on a central conundrum, which is, should the West seek to crush Russia once and for all? Or, as he suggests, should it in fact seek to arrange a condominium in Europe, much as he did in the 1970s with detente between Western and Eastern Europe? Our panelists have starkly divergent views, and I'm going to open with Melinda Herring, who will give the affirmative case. Good morning. Thank you, Jacob, for organizing this debate. Good morning, Will. It's great to be with you all. America should seek to defeat Russia in Ukraine, full stop. We must humble, contain, chasten, and restrain an out-of-control global actor that threatens to plunge the world into ever greater instability. The choice is stark, and it's often not stark in foreign policy. We either cut a deal and whet their appetite, or we cut them down to size and restore a real balance of power. Washington should stop listening to the so-called realists and restrainers. They have been nothing but wrong about Ukraine. They originally predicted that Ukraine would be overrun within days. Wrong. We are more than three months in and Ukraine is winning. Now these so-called realists and restrainers want us to pressure Kiev to give up. Nothing could be more dangerous for the world order. Kiev has stepped up its support. Washington has stepped up its support for Kiev and it should continue to do so. There are at least three reasons why. Number one, supporting Ukraine is in our own national interest if we favor stability, peace, and a global order that works. Will, my friend, if you are going to be a consistent realist, you've got to support Ukraine. Vladimir Putin is threatening the world order. He's not conforming to realist dictates. He's not seeking a balance of power, but launching a genocidal war whose aim is to decapitate and destroy the Ukrainian nation itself. This is an ideological crusade more than it is a decision based on rational assessments of power. Russia has become drunk on its own perverse interpretation of great power ideology, and that assessment threatens peace and stability in Europe. Peace and stability in Europe are a core interest of the United States. Number two, supporting Ukraine is also the right thing to do. It's often not an easy case, but it's an easy case with Ukraine. Putin attacked a peaceful and democratic country three months ago. Since then, Russia has engaged in war crimes and crimes against humanity that are disgusting, that are egregious. And there are credible reports that Russian soldiers have raped and killed civilians. There are credible reports that Russia has forcibly displaced hundreds of thousands of children and civilians from Ukraine to Russia. Russia has attacked homes, schools, theaters, and so on in cities across Ukraine. There are 8 million Ukrainians who've been internally displaced within Ukraine, and another 6.5 million of a country of 44 million have fled. We haven't seen numbers like this since World War II. The UNDP estimates that 9 out of 10 Ukrainians will be poor by Christmas if the war continues. Number three. Moscow must be defeated in Ukraine or it will continue its imperial project elsewhere. The ugly reality is that this war is going to drag on. We've been talking about it in terms of days or weeks. We need to be talking about it in terms of months and years, unfortunately. How do we get a lasting peace? If we want a lasting and durable peace in Europe with Russia contained, the West should continue to arm Ukraine to the teeth. The news today, that the US is going to send sophisticated rocket launching systems is awesome. We need to keep doing that. Kiev will continue to fight like hell. We have to avoid a frozen conflict in Ukraine. 
Moscow wins if the situation becomes a frozen conflict. Moscow has played the frozen conflict game to its advantage in Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. We cannot let Putin get away with it in Ukraine. The stakes are much, much higher. Now, in this, the real spirit of Reagan, in the defense of free peoples against tyranny, the West must continue to act. As my friend, retired General Philip Breedlove, never tires of saying, right place, right time, right equipment, and this should be our mantra until Kiev prevails. Thank you. Will. Will Ruger, please respond. All right, so first let me just say clearly that one cannot help but be impressed by the bravery of the Ukrainian people in fighting for their independence from Russia. But the question of this debate isn't whether Ukrainians are brave or worthy of our emotional support or even our military support, but whether America should seek to humiliate Russia. And there I think the answer is clearly no. Indeed, it would be the height of folly to seek such a goal, no matter how angry one is at Russia or how aligned one and emotional one is uh, in terms of understanding the plight of Ukraine and Ukrainians. So let me start my explanation by doing what we should always do when we think about constructing foreign policy. We need to think about our ends, our goals, our national interests, right? And America's enduring national interests are one, our homeland security, the safety of our country, our territorial integrity, our independence. Two, the conditions of our economic prosperity, such as the freedom to traverse the seas and maintain our space capabilities. And three, our liberal democratic system here at home. And I'm hard pressed to see how humiliating Russia is necessary to achieve those ends, particularly related to the costs it would be required for us to pay to do so. The fact is, is that the US is quite secure no matter what happens in Ukraine, especially given how pathetic the Russian military has proven itself on a battlefield so close to its home. In fact, our wealthy, populous, and militarily capable NATO allies are also quite secure, given that the balance of power favors them relative to Russia, even on their own, and when combined with American power, make it laughable that, you, that Russia, with an economy the size of roughly a mid-sized European state like Italy or Spain, and a defense budget the tenth of ours, that they could seriously threaten the alliance on their own soil. Now let's even, but, but let's just relax that a little bit. Let's even grant for the sake of argument that Ukraine's survival were critical to America or NATO. What is required to safeguard Ukraine is much less than what it would take to humiliate them and far less dangerous. We could continue to provide arms to Ukraine to make sure they stay afloat, but not so much that they aim for maximal goals that could cause Russia to escalate, including to the use of nuclear weapons. The fact is, is that humiliating Russia doesn't do anything for our interests. How does humiliation help us any more than a Russia stalemated by continued Ukrainian survival? It doesn't. And if we took the actions that would be likely to be necessary to humiliate Russia, putting in place a no-fly zone, pushing Russia out of Crimea, taking the fight into Russia itself, that would require much greater US intervention in the war. And I just don't see how that makes young people in Des Moines, or older people in Florida any safer. And it would threaten to compromise our fundamental national interests, all for revenge, because certainly it is laughable that those actions make anyone in America safer or more prosperous. How would it threaten our ends? Because the only real way that the war in Ukraine would even come close to undermining our vital national interests is if we found ourselves on an escalatory spiral that led to a nuclear exchange between the US and Russia. So we should do everything we can to prevent that from happening, which means setting clear limits to how much we are willing to push Russia, given the risk of such an escalatory spiral. And if you don't believe me, you should believe people at the Atlantic Council, where Melinda works, because they haven't ruled out the possibility of a nuclear exchange. So Walter Slocum of the Atlantic Council board thought it was possible if Putin, if Putin were pushed too far, as did Alex Vershbo of the Atlantic Council. So it is a non-zero possibility with extreme consequences. That means that the risk is too high for the United States. We should also appreciate the second order consequences of humiliating Russia. Um, one is that it would push Russia even closer to China when China is really the only serious strategic competitor of the United States. 
Lastly, I'd note that it may not even be possible for Russia to be humiliated any more than it already has been without direct US or NATO entry into the war. Can Ukraine really push back to the pre-2014 status quo? You know, there are new reports coming out that say that there are challenges facing the Ukrainian military right now. So it may not even be possible to humiliate them even if we wanted to. So rather than humiliating Russia, we should urge Ukraine to settle short of that. It would be to our interests and even to Ukraine's for that to happen. Excellent, thank you, Will. I'd like to give our panelists an opportunity to respond to their opening remarks. So first I will go to Melinda. Thanks, I hate the question in the way that the debate was framed. I'm not going to defend the word humiliate. I, I said that America should seek to defeat Russia and Ukraine full stop. The verbs that I'm willing to defend are humble, contain, chasten and restrain. Those those are defensible words. Uh, I, I, I don't think that humiliating another a, a power is is should be policy. Look, uh, you said that we have three interests. We have security, we have economics, and then we have our, our liberal democratic order at home. Uh, we also want stability. We want stable food prices. We want, and, and we don't have that right now. Uh, we also have crazy fuel prices. Uh, we have to get this right. Uh, and that is part of the reason why there's urgency now. If we appease Russia, they are going to come back again and again and again. This is, we've seen this since 2008. Russia keeps doing it. Now on nukes, uh, is it possible that Russia will use nukes? Yes, it's not very likely. Would they use nukes in Crimea if Ukraine tried to retake Crimea? Maybe. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, that's a real uh, debate right now, though, Will. The question is, who's going to win the Donbass? Is the U.S. going to give the Ukrainians the weapons they need to retake their land? That's what this basically boils down to. Uh, there, this idea that the Ukrainians are going to take the war into Russia is a nonsense argument. That 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 is an argument that that is uh, being spread by people who are afraid of the Russian bear. And the escalation argument is nonsense. If you look at the forces, Russia doesn't have much power to escalate. They don't have more capable military forces. They don't have more uh, more. Um, leadership ready to roll. They don't have the kinds of weapon systems ready. They don't have, they don't have enough weapons. They don't have enough, um, they, they can't, they don't have enough transportation systems as well. There is a limit on how much uh, Russia can escalate and that we've seen their limits in this conflict. The, the bottom line is that if we do not make the right choice now, it, uh, Russia is going to come back again and again and again, and it is in our interest to have peace and security in Europe and to have stable fuel prices and for the world to not starve. We are on the precipice of a global food shortage because of Russia's behavior. Russia has throttled all the ports in the Black Sea, and there's an enormous amount of grain that's going to feed Southeast Europe, or sorry, Southeast Asia and Africa, and it can't get out because of Russia. Will, please, uh, what's your response? Yeah, so I think there's a fundamental contradiction in what you're saying, Melinda, right? So you're saying that they don't have much to escalate, right? They don't have a lot of capabilities left to actually be that dangerous uh, to us. But then you say it's really necessary that the United States, um, you know, continue to, to, um, to push Russia and to, and again, if you don't like the word humiliate, a lot of what you said would be humiliating, um, you say that we need to be in there, that it's so necessary. I mean, so on the one hand, you're claiming Russian weakness, and on the other hand, you're claiming that it's a great threat. And I think that's a real problem here. I mean, the fact is, is that Russia is has always been overrated as a threat to the United States and our interests. And it's been made especially clear in this conflict, right? The logistical challenges, the poor morale, the military performance on the battlefield, which shows a, a lack of the ability to do combined arms fighting very effectively against a, a relatively weaker force, and one certainly much weaker than the United States and NATO itself. So I just don't buy this argument that it's very dangerous in that sense, and it's only proven itself more so. Um, you know, on the come back again and again and again, I mean, well, you know, if they're going to come back again and again and again, I mean, what are you calling us to do, right? I mean, that would that would seem to suggest that we need to do even more than simply to, 
you know, support the Ukrainians in taking back, uh, you know, the Donbass. Um, I mean, if they're going to come back again and again and again, are you saying that we need to give a formal security commitment to Ukraine to add them to NATO? Well, that was part of the rationale uh, or the reasons behind the conflict itself. Again, it's not the only reason, but it was certainly contributory towards the security dilemma that we saw. And then I would lastly just say, like, look, you, this worldview you have relies upon the notion that there's a seamless web of interests, that if there is aggression anywhere, that automatically that implicates the interests of other countries. And it simply doesn't. And, and so, um, you know, I think that we need to kind of calm down, look at it coldly and calculating, because we don't want to get into something that even if low probability has high cost, and that means that the risk is high. Melinda, I think we, we need to have another round here. Uh, what's, what's so off base about what Will is saying? Why not take a more modulated approach and not panic in the face of a Russian army that does not really seem all that capable of attacking NATO? So if we, if we appease Russia, Will, Will's talking about appeasement. If we appease Russia, uh, we are going to have a world that none of us want to live in. It, it's going to enable other rogue states to do the same thing. That's why we have to defeat Russia in Ukraine. Uh, this is a really stark choice. We cut a deal and then Russia is going to come back or we restore a balance of power. Russia is powerful. It is making, uh, Will, Will is right. It's making a real uh, concerted effort in the Donbass now. Ukraine will not win if the West does not send weapons uh, and enable it to defend its own territory. The, there's, a, there's a time issue here now. If, if the weapons do not arrive on time, the, the heavy weapons that, that Ukraine has been promised, Ukraine is going to lose. And, and uh, Russia is going to take at least uh, two, if not four, oblasts of Ukraine. And they're gonna, they're gonna go after Odessa, they're gonna go after, after Kiev, they're gonna try to overrun the country. Uh, and they say the, the Russian, pro Russian propaganda says that it's gonna go after more places. Is, is this a world that we want to live in, Will? It's not a world that I want to live in. And this argument that, that the discussion over NATO is what inflamed the crisis is nonsense. Look at what Vladimir Putin says in his essays. He may think, uh, he may think and see the world in, in, in this way, but he wants more land. He's regathering the Russian lands. He's thinking about his legacy. He wants to go down in history as a great Russian leader. And you do that by regathering the lands. He also saw that it was the perfect time. He had a weak, uh, the, the White House is weak. Europe is weak. It was the time to go in. There was a ne never a better time. And he has an emotional link with Ukraine. He cannot see Ukraine. He can't let it go. I mean, the great phrase is, is that without Ukraine, Russia ceases to be an empire. He has this long emotional uh, attachment to Ukraine. That, that, that's what this is about. This is not about NATO whatsoever. Should, what should we do about uh, Ukraine's security guarantees? That's a big question. That's a really big question. But the idea, Henry Kissinger's idea that we should sit down and negotiate doesn't work. Neither side is willing to negotiate. Moscow is not serious about negotiating. And after Bucha, after the war crimes outside of Kiev, Kiev is not willing to negotiate. There's no way out at this point. It has to be fought at the battlefield. And it needs the, the war needs to be fought uh, now, and it needs to be over as soon as possible to limit human suffering, to limit, uh, to limit the, the, all the economic repercussions that we're seeing around the world as well. Will, is Melinda the true realist here in uh, sketching this dark scenario that only a, a battle between the two sides and a, a, a continuing clash can resolve the divergent interests between Ukraine and Russia? Are, are we doomed to this? No, I mean, M Melinda's a, a lot of wonderful things, but she's not a, a realist. Um, you know, I count her as a friend uh, and for good reason, but she's not a realist. I mean, realists throughout history have understood about the importance of not pushing, uh, you know, other powers such uh, that they uh, that they may lash out, uh, that they may not be possible, um, uh, you know, uh, make weights in the balance of power of the future. I talked about the issue of China. Uh, you know, Russia and China should be natural antagonists. Uh, they should be part 
of a balance against China. And we should be happy to, to be able to sit back and watch Russia and China balance each other, as well as others in the region. Uh, you know, but again, I, I, one thing I do want to agree with, with, with Melinda about is she said, this is not about NATO. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, this is about Ukraine. And, and Melinda is a very skilled advocate for Ukraine's interests. And, and you know, there's, there's no better friend of Ukraine in many ways than Melinda. But what I'm here to do is to kind of think about what's in America's interests. And I think that that's what we're called upon to look at. And it's not in America's interests uh, to do what might be necessary to, to go back, maybe not to the pre-2014, uh, but to go back to a situation in what, which Russia is expelled from those oblasts that, that Melinda were ta was talking about. That would take a lot more, I think, than we would need. And, and is a, fr a frozen conflict all that bad, especially when it comes to stability? Um, you know, she talks about stability being so important and peace, but what she's advocating is something that would lead to war that could last for years and all of those second order consequences. Now, again, if we want to talk about the issue of food security in the world and whatnot, well, we should have tried to negotiate an end to this conflict much earlier. If the end of the United States is to prevent food insecurity in the world, there are other means than trying to fight it all the way to the Russian border in the East. So again, uh, I think that when it comes to both America's interests and some of these global interests, the answer is diplomacy ending in either a frozen conflict or ending in a negotiated settlement. Before that we is go realistic about what actually can be achieved as opposed to what our ideals might suggest. Before we go to Melinda, I just wanna follow up on, on one thing which is how realistic is diplomacy, Will? That was Melinda's original question. If, is this in fact a fearic exercise that will just result in a bunch of diplomats meeting and never going anywhere as the clash is settled on the ground? Why is Melinda wrong when she says, this is a mano, a mano contest and the job of the United States is to support not its ally, but it's, I guess it's friendly nation in the battle against Russia. Why, why is she wrong? Right, I, I don't think the realist would say that the United States couldn't provide support uh, to, to Ukraine to, to bleed the Russians and, and to make sure that Ukraine's um, independence isn't fully compromised. Uh, you could be realistic and say that. I also think you could say as a realist that look, the battle for Ukraine is really important for Ukraine, but doesn't necessarily impl implicate in a direct way NATO and the United States. But I don't think you need to make that harder argument. What I would say, though, is that the United States could realistically support Ukraine, but promote what's going to happen on the at the diplomatic table by making sure that we don't create reckless driving on behalf of the Ukrainians where they believe that they're going to get much more support from the United States and NATO uh, than they will. And so they take efforts that compromise the ability to deal at the table, right? I think what's going to happen is ultimately you'll get diplomacy when both sides believe that they will not have an advantage in continuing to fight, but could, would actually have an advantage in settling things based on what has happened on the battlefield. But as long as Ukraine believes that it might get what Melinda wants, and as long as Russia believes that it might be able to get more, then I think, yes, you could have fighting. Um, I think one of the problems with Melinda's approach, actually, uh, and, I, and I said that, she, that Ukraine has no better front, friend, I think that's in terms of her intentions. The results could actually be quite bad for Ukraine, because if we keep um, providing um, or, or we suggest that we'll provide absolute support, that could give Ukraine the belief that it should continue fighting to the very last Ukrainian. And I don't think that that is in fact good for Ukraine or for international stability. Melinda, uh, Will made several assertions there that I think you should respond to. One is I think that uh, you're advocating what you perceive as Ukraine's true interests rather than America's. And the other that you are in fact emboldening what he called reckless driving in Ukraine. What's your response? 
I got more issues than just those two points, Jacob. Uh, That's the fine. Way, the way that, that Will sort of clinically describes Russia and Ukraine is really disgusting. This is, this is a moral conflict. Russia is the aggressor. Russia is not a neutral actor. Russia is the reason why millions of people in the world are going to starve. Russia choked access at all the Black Sea ports. And now it's saying, uh, if you lift the sanctions, we will allow ships to go out. Uh, what, what kind of behavior is that? Why should we reward them? They are the aggressor. They've killed thousands of innocent people. We cannot reward their behavior. We will keep getting the same thing over and over again. I am not Ukrainian. I am an American. I'm a proud American. And this is in America's national interest to make sure that the world turns out right. That, that's, that's why I believe the things I do. And, and the U.S. is not in a position, the, the U.S. has not given Ukraine a blank check. That is nonsense. The U.S. has been restrained. I would criticize the Biden administration for being too restrained. Uh, they have, they're very worried about uh, sending heavy weapons systems. They have uh, not, Zelensky is the one who's saying, give me a blank check. Don't put limits on what you're doing. Zelensky is driving this. The Ukrainian people are driving this. Look at the public opinion polling. The Ukrainian people are saying, we will fight. We will not give an inch. So this is a BS argument. Ukraine is in charge of this fight. Ukraine def uh, defines victory. The United States does not. This idea that, that Washington is pressing uh, Washington is pressing Kiev on to fight is nonsense. And this idea about negotiations is also nonsense. There's been multiple rounds of negotiations and they're not real. Russia has not sent real negotiators. This is going to come down to Zelensky and Putin and Putin is not willing to meet with Zelensky. So yes, I want peace. I absolutely want peace. I wanna be able to go back to Ukraine and I wanna see this country succeed, but there's not gonna be any peace uh, in, 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 until, uh, until one side can overwhelm the other side on the battlefield. That's just the reality of the situation. And we are only doing what the Ukrainians have asked of us. And it is long-term U.S. policy to support free people. If people get to make their own decisions about their future and about their countries. So this isn't some academic debate. Um, it, this is about real people and real lives. And that's why the U.S. has to, I mean, has to continue to have a stake in it. We've already made this choice. We've already stuck our neck out. The question is, are we going to let them, uh, are, we gonna, are we gonna let them lose? And I think that's a very easy answer. Will, I think we should get a response from you, particularly on the issue of morality, which is often flung at realists. The response of realists more often than not, I think, being that their position is, in fact, not just rational or grounded in balance of power considerations, but also moral in the end, in its uh, fear of untoward consequences. Will? Yeah, I, I think I think realism um, has a compelling uh, moral foundation, right? That the pursuit of the national interest uh, is one that is is moral, uh, and that the consequences of approaching the world in a non-emotional, rational way that looks at states' interests and tries to adjudicate those interests in a way that helps promote stability. Uh, is, is moral from the standpoint of, of a global perspective as well. Uh, but even more so, I think, is the case that, that look, the United States, um, the government, has a primary res responsibility for the interests of its citizens and our country. And the most important thing it can do to support that moral end is to make sure that the United States does not get into an escalatory spiral with another great power that could lead to conventional or nuclear war when it's not critical to the United States to do so. We've seen this repeatedly over the last 20 to 30 years when the United States has made moral claims like Melinda does about free people and we've gotten ourselves into conflict that have only harmed us. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we need to you know, think of, you know, too much about just uh, Iraq or Afghanistan, we can think about Libya, we can think about Syria, where a kind of over uh, aggressiveness around kind of moral causes has led to not just problematic things for the national interest narrowly defined, but for problems on the ground, right? Think about Libya, right? Arms flowed in, 
uh, right, arms flowed out rather, terrorists flowed in, there was civil conflicts, instability in neighboring countries, right? The fact is, is that a moral approach to warfare in that narrow sense of morality and to, to statecraft leads to problematic consequences. But again, I mean, I, I think that, that um, you know, the, the, the challenge for American diplomacy, uh, I think going forward, American statecraft going forward, is make sure, making sure that we can center on those things that are the biggest challenges to us. That would be the challenges of, uh, posed by the rise of China. I think it's the challenges we he have here domestically at home. Uh, and we need to spend the necessary time, energy, attention, and resources on those two issues, the rise of China and our problems here at home. We need domestic renewal. Um, and I think that spending too much on these moral, or on these, sorry, these, these I think, um, um, idealistic goals, uh, I think is too much. And, and I think that we ought to, again, use our, our proper offices to try to promote an end to this conflict. And I even think that it's, that it's acceptable uh, to provide uh, arms so that it, it is not, uh, so that Ukraine uh, and their sovereignty, their independence is not overwhelmed by Russia. But I think that the prop, this debate was meant to be about whether we should humiliate Russia. And I think a lot of the things that, that Melinda wants to do, even though she doesn't like the, the, the name of the, the title of the program, would be humiliating and would not be within what Putin will accept short of, I think, escalating. And I think that's why we should try to find a, a, a solution that both Ukraine and Russia won't like, but they will also could embrace. This leads us uh, very nicely to a question from Paul Hare, and I've been somewhat delinquent in posing questions from the audience, but I hope to get to as many of them as possible. Paul, who is a fellow at the Center for Na the National Interests, asks, is it actually realistic to judge that Ukraine can reclaim its lost territories, Donbass and Crimea, and Russia will simply retreat into quiescence? Melinda. So yes and no is the answer. On Crimea, it's gonna be really complicated and hard. And uh, if I were giving the Ukrainians advice, I would, uh, I would not advise them to, to try to retake Crimea. It, there's too many Russian forces there. It's too armed. Uh, I think that you need to do a Baltic solution. The, the international community should continue to not recognize that it's part of, uh, part, part of Russia and that eventually it will change. But is it possible to retake uh, the Donbass? Absolutely, it can be retaken by Christmas. That's what military analysts tell me. If, if the United States and uh, Western supporters uh, send the right weapons. Wow, Melinda is really bullish on the uh, Ukrainian military. Will? Yeah, um, uh, I'm, always, uh, 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 I, I'm always squeamish when I hear people talking about how, uh, you know, the troops will take something or be home by Christmas. Um, and that might be the timeline that experts think, but it, it recalls previous optimism uh, of the past that uh, have led to the deaths of many, many, many soldiers uh, due to that. Um, uh, I, 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 again, like if, um, if Ukraine can take the Donbass, um, you know, I, and it's going to take until Christmas, then some of the problems that Melinda pointed out before could still be, uh, you know, in play. And so the question is, is would, would the international uh, community, would the United States, would Ukraine and Russia be better off if there was a possibility of, of trying to, um, uh, uh, to resolve differences uh, uh, before then, um, you know, based on a, a kind of local balance of power? Now, again, I'm not all that optimistic about that. I think that it's much more likely that you'll see kind of grinding conflict on the ground. Um, but one worry I do have, and, and, and one of the problems is that we just don't have a lot of great reporting on this, but one of my worries is that Ukraine's military uh, is not in the shape uh, that I think we would all hope it to be. Um, and, and that there was a Washington Post article yesterday that suggested some of these challenges. Um, you know, and, uh, and I think we can hope that they're not true because I think a, a worst case scenario is that Ukraine 
went past the kind of Klauswitzian uh, culminating point um, and, and could be ripe for Ukraine using its material advantages in a way that could lead Russia to do more uh, than uh, it has. Uh, I hope that that's not the case. We have a question from Paul Starobin, who's written extensively on Russia that really cuts to the chase of our debate today. And he asks, isn't the real goal of humiliation of Russia to force Vladimir Putin from power? And I would say, judging from my conversations and meetings in Washington, the, the consensus among in Washington is that this is a golden opportunity to essentially exact not just a price tag, but revenge against Putin and Russia for what it has done since 2014 in terms of expanding its influence in the West and interfering in the American presidential election. So here we have this golden opportunity to excise the cancer in the Kremlin. Is this in fact likely to occur? Melinda? You want me to play Old Testament prophet, Jacob? Okay, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, uh, look, I don't think anyone knows, to be honest. Uh, we just don't have very much information right now. There's very little reporting in Moscow. Uh, we don't know how weak Vladimir Putin is or his circle. There's all kinds of reports that he has. I've lost track. Cancer, Parkinson's. Yeah, he has some kind of medical condition. Russian journalists have said that an oncologist is seeing him regularly. All I know is that Vladimir Putin is different now than he was when he took office at the end of 1999. I think he's always been a risk taker, but he was a cautious risk taker. And now he's bet the whole house uh, on Ukraine. Is it policy to try to get rid of Putin? I think the West would love to get rid of Putin. I think everyone would love to get rid of Putin, uh, but I, I, I don't see that happening uh, anytime soon. And even if he were to die or to be put in a sanatorium, as some people have uh, suggested, uh, I think that, that the replacement could be worse than Putin. Will. Yeah, I think we have to be careful about uh, assuming that uh, Russia's policies would necessarily be a lot better um, if you had the next man or woman up. Um, you know, Russia has long-term national interests that are implicated by what's been happening in the Ukraine uh, for some time. Uh, you know, that would include the issue of uh, Ukraine uh, becoming part of NATO, becoming part of the EU, engaging in military-to-military -military exercises with the United States to improve interoperability. Right. These are all things that any Russian leader would be concerned about. Uh, now, whether they would have the same type of risk profile as Putin is a, is a different story. And Melinda's right. You could have someone who is worse. Um, but I think the bigger point here is that I think it's folly for the United States to think about its foreign policy as being advanced, per se, through regime change operations around the world. Um, a, it, it understates the importance of vital national interests that are objective, no matter who the leader is. But B, I think it understates the unintended consequences of doing so. Um, and, and you can see that even with some of U.S. efforts to, in, to promote uh, 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 its, its values and its, its, uh, its preferences abroad uh, globally, including in U Ukraine. Um, and so I think that and it also just relies, I think, on, on, on bad international relations theory, right? And, and again, people like to disdain theory, but theory helps us understand the world. And I think that one of the bad arguments about regime change, right, is that the United States can't be safe unless other places look like us. And I just think that that's, that's just not true. For one, it's not true, but two, it's not, not very likely at reasonable cost that we could create a world that look like that where other states look like us. Um, other, sta other states and peoples have different preferences and values uh, and interests. And, and, and also, as we saw in, uh, um, it was a great piece by Ido Oren who talked about how uh, oftentimes we construct how others look based on our interests, not on actually what, they, what, the, what the state um, looks like itself. And so we have to be careful of the fact that we could be misperceiving quite frequently when we think about what other states look like based on our national interests. 
We have a question from uh, Harley Baltzer who asks, should there be some kind of price for Putin's violation of Ukraine's territory? Melinda? So he's talking about the 1994 Budapest Memorandum. And I, I think I would prefer to focus on security guarantees now, uh, Harley. So what should it look like? Should it be NATO? Should it be NATO light? Should it be the so-called Israeli option where uh, you basically arm Ukraine to the teeth with mo uh, modern weapons? Uh, I, I favor all of the above. Uh, the most realistic is probably the Israeli option. Uh, I, th I think the bottom line is we need to figure out what victory looks like. Right now, that's the big question. Uh, is victory uh, pushing the Russians back to the 2014 borders? Is it retaking Crimea? Uh, Volodymyr Zelensky has a big problem because he said that it's Crimea and it's the Donbass. And I, th I think that's going to be a an impossible uh, to achieve. It's also uh, making sure that there's justice. That's also going to be very difficult to, to achieve since Russia is not party to a lot of the, the agreements it would need to be if you'd want to bring them to international court. It's also forcing Russia to, to bear the costs. So there's billions of dollars that have been destroyed uh, as a result of the war. Uh, you know, what is justice and what, look, and what does uh, victory look like? I think th that's really the big question right now. Will? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I, I don't favor Ukraine ever becoming part of NATO. Um, uh, e you know, e even if Russia were a threat to uh, to Ukraine's uh, uh, independence, uh, which seems less likely now, given the performance of Russia's military, uh, I just don't think it's in our interest. The United States won the Cold War with Ukraine being part of the Soviet Union. Ukraine is a relatively weak country. Um, it's not very economically important to the West, um, and 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 we can certainly get what we need without Ukraine being inside a security agreement that would force us to go to war with Russia if something like this happened again. And I just don't believe that we can make a credible enough commitment to Ukraine uh, for the Russians to be deterred in that situation, uh, especially given that we've proven ourselves unwilling to use direct intervention in the war. So why would Russia believe that, that we're gonna send American boys and girls over there in the future to do so? So we should definitely take Ukraine being part of NATO off the table. It just doesn't matter to our security. Um, so I, I would take that off the table. Um, as far as you know, some kind of uh, uh, security commitment, um, one of the problems with some of the things that I've seen actually is that they could be out of NATO, but get a, a guarantee that would be something that even NATO countries have, right? Article five does not commit the United States to actually going to war if a member nation were invaded. Uh, uh, people like Evo Dalgir, for example, have said this, and he's someone who is as pro NATO as anyone. So we wouldn't want to commit to something that was even more severe than what we would have to commit to in the case of NATO. Um, and then when it comes to arming Ukraine, uh, again, I think that that every independent state in the world should have the ability and power to try to protect itself in a dangerous anarchic environment. So why would I be opposed to Ukraine being able to do that? The question is, is what should we do? And, and, and I don't think that we would want to arm Ukraine such uh, that it would have revanchist uh, desires in the Donbass should there be an agreement uh, where they would lose it. I don't want to be in a situation that's akin to what we faced in Europe in the past, where revanchist desires led to war again, and then we got dragged into it. Uh, this Melinda. is third. Hold on a second. Revanchist desires should only be applied to Russia, not to Ukraine. Will I have to remind you again? Russia is the aggressor. Ukraine is the innocent victim. You seem to keep forgetting that point over and over again. You also said if Russia threatens Ukraine's independence. What are they doing now, brother? So, well, so Melinda, let, let's be careful here, right? Um, in 1871, Germany, the new German state, uh, took Alsace and Lorraine. Uh, and, and one could argue that that was through aggression. Um, uh, the fact is, is that French revanchism exists whether or not it was justified or not, and whether or not France or Germany was the aggressor. Right. So revanchism doesn't you know, take a moral stand. The fact is, is that if you had a frozen conflict 
or you had a negotiated settlement where Ukraine did not get back to its pre-2014 borders, and then it became armed to the teeth, um, then you could imagine revanchism occurring that could be destructive to the stability and peace that you've said you cared so much about. Melinda, I think you should respond. I, I think uh, Will is living in the ivory tower. Ukraine is only wants its territory. It doesn't. It, it does not have an imperial desire to take Moscow or Saint Petersburg. It wants its borders full stop. And there's no. I, I said this over and over again. And I, I'm sorry to be so boring, but negotiations are not real right now. There's, there's no way you're going to be able to convince either side uh, to give up territory. Both sides think that Crimea belongs to them. Both sides think the Donbass belongs to them. Uh, I've asked all the diplomats uh, in Washington, what do you do about this? They all shrug their shoulders. Will, I have something I want to I want to follow up uh, sure. from your earlier remarks about the Clausewitzian moment, that, that portentous phrase you used. One of the things that struck me, and I, I'd be curious for your for your response is that when Russia invaded February 24th, went in mm -hmm. and uh, took many Western observers by surprise, Putin rolled the dice. He thought he was gonna have the Blitzkrieg victory, did not pan out. But at that time, early on, my strong impression is that many, many realists said we should not bother aiding Ukraine because Russia is going to overrun it. Now, I think a number of realists are saying the danger in aiding Ukraine is that Ukraine will overrun Russia. Is there a contradiction there? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's likely, I, and I agree with Melinda, I don't think it's very likely that Ukraine will be able to overrun Russia if what we mean is um, fully taking back the Crimea or taking the fight into Russia. For one, I mean, my argument about why we should be careful here relies on the fact that, or, or, the, or, the, or the worry that, the, that if, if Russia were pushed into such a situation, that they would use nuclear weapons. And again, like I said earlier, don't believe me, I uh, believe Walter Slocum and Alex Vershbo of the Atlantic Council, who have said it's a non-zero chance that in that situation, Russia would use nuclear weapons in one way or another. So I would like to avoid that. But I want to kind of go back to something, which is, you know, Melinda wants to paint this realist approach as something that's fundamentally radical. But for one, um, it's one of the oldest approaches to foreign policy, and it has served countries well. But number two, is that the Biden administration itself, and, and, and I'm, I'm not a, a Biden supporter by any means, but the Biden administration itself through its revealed preferences uh, is saying that Ukraine's, Ukraine doesn't matter so much that they're willing to actually go to the wall for it, right? The United States has been relatively, uh, um, I think, prudential uh, in many cases in how it's approached this. For one, um, you know, Melinda and, and some of her friends uh, have promoted the idea of a no-fly zone. Um, they wrote a letter that got a lot of prominent attention. And, and then Stephen Wertheim of the Carnegie Endowment and I put together another letter that uh, talked about why that was a problem. It's a good part of the battle of ideas. I like doing that. Um, but the fact is, is that the Biden administration agreed with Stephen and I and the signers of, of our statement, right? They didn't put a no-fly zone in place. Um, uh, they haven't uh, thought that it was valuable for the United States or NATO to directly intervene in the conflict. If Ukraine's survival were so important that the kind of stability and peace of the world depended on it, why aren't we doing more? And I think the reason is, is because our interests just aren't implicated and the dangers of doing a ton more are much too dangerous for the United States and the world. So again, like there's, there's kind of talk and then there's action. And the fact is, is that the actions that the United States and NATO have taken uh, have not been that extreme. Although I do think cutting $40 billion check to Ukraine uh, was ill-advised. So Melinda, is Will right? Are you in fact flirting with disaster up to and including a nuclear confrontation between the US and Russia? And is the Biden administration prudently ignoring some of the 
more some of the suggestions that you and your colleagues have been making? I think the Biden administration sees this as a, a real threat and has put real money behind it and real resources behind it. And th as evidenced by the, the check and then the, the announcement today that they're gonna be sending uh, multiple, the, the, the sophisticated rocket launcher systems. So I, I don't think it, it's fair to say that, that uh, this is not a priority for the White House. It, it is a priority they think about it all the time um, and they're in constant contact uh, with the Ukrainians. I mean, this could turn into World War III, right? They're aware of that. Now, I don't think, uh, some of my colleagues have said that Putin could use nukes. I think, yes, he could use nukes, but he's not doing the things that are required to use nukes. The people that I talk to are more worried about him using chemical weapons than nuclear weapons. So let, no one knows. No one knows what's in his mindset, but it's not like he wakes up and presses a button. There's a lot of things that have to, to, to happen between him uh, waking up and saying, okay, boys, let's do this uh, and, and pressing a button. And those things are not happening. So this is not what I worry about at night. What I worry about is this becoming a protracted conflict. I'm with you, Will, and that there's 100,000 dead. I think that Vladimir Putin thinks in terms uh, of years and that economic costs are not uh, economic costs and loss of life are not going to deter him, even if you know, even if the Russian army uh, continues to have big loss of life and it hurts, it throttles the economy. I, I think he can continue and he will continue. Uh, and uh, I, I, I have, I, I, I'm not a realist by any stretch of the imagination, but I think the realist argument favors strong uh, engagement in Ukraine. Uh, I mean, if if it were up to you. You said that we would be sending weapons. What would we be sending? AK-47s? What would we? What would we be sending if you were in the White House? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, again, I I just don't don't I don't think that it's on the realist um, to make the case for why we shouldn't intervene. I think it's on the advocates of intervention for why we ought to. And I think if you look at the connection between ends and, and, and what are the required means to keep us safe, secure, and prosperous, I just don't see a lot of these uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, extravagant or, or uh, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, extensive uh, engagements to be required. Um, and, and, and again, I, I think part of the problem of the Washington foreign policy establishment is that it frequently rel relies on bromides like appeasement or 1938 or, you know, we need to defend the liberal international order. But I don't think that that tells Americans why they should potentially be at risk of a nuclear conflict. Um, and, and, and again, if it really were 1938 again, uh, if appeasement really meant the things that, that Melinda talks about, why aren't we considering direct intervention, right? I mean, I think that's the challenge here is that there's a disconnect between where some people are willing to go and the claims they're making about what the danger is. And I would say not that the danger is so great that we should directly intervene. I think it's actually that we need to understand and be a little bit more discerning about the fact that the implications aren't as great as they claim. And that we, what we should be doing uh, is, I think, not promoting maximalism on the part of Zelensky in Ukraine, while at the same time making sure that there are pressures put upon Russia such that it doesn't believe that it can get what it wants fully on the battlefield either, which is why a kind of modest arming of Ukraine uh, will probably lead to uh, the, the second best result here, uh, which is... Uh, the potential for negotiation. Melinda, this, this must uh, sound like heresy to you. No, I, I want to read what Sandy Vershbaugh, he said. He says, for the record, this is Ambassador Sandy Vershbaugh. He's the former U.S. ambassador to Russia and number two at NATO. He said, the probability of Russian using nukes was low, uh, below 5%. Deterrence depends on threatening, decisive, and swift response. And he he put, he put his uh, writing there. Uh, I, I take issue with, with what Will said, though. I don't think that uh, I have it, that my side has extravagant ends. We want to avoid genocide. We want to avoid worldwide famine. We want to avoid insane energy prices. That's what we're talking about here. We want to avoid another world war. If you give the Ukrainians AK-47s, they cannot adequately defend themselves. Again, Russia started this. 
the, the Ukrainians have suffered enormously. I don't want to see any more buchas. The only way to avoid more buchas is to make sure that the Ukrainians have the weapons that they need now. And no one here is pressing for maximalist aims. That's And I, 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 you're asking, why aren't we putting boots on the ground? Because there's political realities. You know the answer to that question. Come on, you're too smart to ask a question like that. At what point will, would Putin be satisfied? Let's say the United States conceded a, a sphere of influence to him in, in Ukraine. Would this, uh, simply whet the appetite for more? Or do you think it would uh, prompt the Europeans who are already starting to up their defense outlays to take a, a stronger stance on behalf of their own militaries to establish a true balance of power in Europe, which at the moment clearly does not exist without the United States? Well, I mean, as you know, Jacob, uh, realists are not all that enthusiastic about trying to base their policies on the intentions of other leaders because they're difficult to know and they can change. I think what we have to do is base our policies on our internal interests, the threats to those, um, and the balance of power. And I think that in the case of, of Russia, uh, it has structural weaknesses that make it unlikely to achieve um, major power status, uh, and to be a threat to the United States or its NATO allies in any other way than the nuclear option. Um, and so, uh, you know, what type of, uh, of sphere of influence that it has in, in Russia, or sorry, in Ukraine, I think um, is, is not as fundamental to asking what are the kind of basic elements about Russia and the balance of power in Europe that relate to our interests and the interests of our allies? Um, and, and there, I think that defense and deterrence uh, will be enough to safeguard ourselves. I mean, I mean, part of the problem of, of this debate, right, is, is that, first of all, we've gotten away from the, the, the debate question, which is humiliation. Now, I don't think we've gotten as far away as Melinda might think, because a lot of what she would, I think, argue for uh, would be the potential for humiliation that could lead to the bad results I talk about. But it's also that, look, if, if this is a debate about what I or Melinda would argue Ukraine should do to satisfy its national interests, that's just a very different argument than what the United States should do to satisfy it, its interests vis-a-vis -vis Russia and the global context in which US-Russia relations take place. And, you know, and I, and I would just, you know, reference, you know, the piece by Patrick Porter, Justin Logan and Ben Friedman that was in Politico, right? We're not all Ukrainians now. We should not, basically they're arguing, we shouldn't pretend that Western interests are fully aligned with Kyiv's risks about escalating the war. Um, so I, I think that this is a, an important distinction to make. U.S. interests and NATO interests are not coterminous with Kyiv's. And we need to find a path forward with the only state in that region that is fundamentally important to the United States, which is, which is Russia. And again, Russia is a competitor and an adversary. And so we need to take them seriously. I'm not arguing uh, for us accommodating any vital interests. Well, let's end with one final question with a 30 second to one minute response from each of you getting back to since I need to uh, placate Will, who, who feels that we have drifted from our central question, and I always want to make Will happy. Um, <laughs> let me uh, pose the question, bouncing off one from Paul Hare, which is that Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said that Russia should be weakened permanently. That's the aim of the United States. How likely do you think it is that Russia will be permanently weakened if we come back to this question in six months. Melinda? So it, it's inevitable, right? We thought, let's go back to February 23rd. Most analysts thought the Russian army was 10 feet tall. The Russian army is not 10 feet tall. It may not even be two feet tall. Part of the reason why the analysts got the situation wrong is they didn't understand 
all of the problems in the Russian army and this great modernization that allegedly happened was nonsense. There's enormous corruption in the Russian army. And we also underestimated the strength of the Ukrainian forces. So there were massive reforms within the Ukrainian armed forces from 2014 on. And analysts don't really know very much about what happened, how they've uh, embraced NATO standards and how their, their tactics have changed. And that's part of the reason why so many analysts got the picture wrong. But yes, I, I think that this idea of an invincible Russia has been forever blown. Well, yeah, look, I, I think that the, re the revelations about Russian military capabilities on the battlefield um, only lead one to, to embrace a greater restraint even more, right? I mean, if it's about safeguarding America's, uh, you know, territorial integrity, our safety and our prosperity, then, then clearly this um, shell of what we thought uh, is, is not the risk of, uh, of, of uh, what we saw uh, in the 1930s and, and early 1940s, right? And, and so when people hearken back to that, it's a real error, right? I mean, Russia is not that great a threat um, to the territorial integrity of the United States or of our NATO allies unless we escalated to a nuclear conflict. Now, does that mean we have to take Russia seriously? Yes. But does that mean that we have to, I think, um, humiliate Russia uh, or um, engage in a kind of um, uh, con uh, constraint plus, uh, which means actually trying to roll them back from uh, the status quo now. I, I don't think American security is re is required. Now, certainly for Ukraine, I have no problem with Ukraine wanting to, to get back uh, what it believes is its territory, right? Um, all states would like to do that. Um, so I don't have a problem with that. But again, it's that local balance of power that's going to matter for Ukraine and Russia. And it's the global balance of power that we should look to for the United States. Well, I hope our viewers have enjoyed this titanic clash as much as I have between our seasoned, practiced, and eloquent exponents of their respective positions. With that, our debate comes to an end.